Salvation in the Orthodox Concept by His Holiness Pope Shenouda III The Story of This Book Salvation is one of the most important topics of belief and theology. Suffice that for the salvation of mankind, the Incarnation, Redemption, and Atonement have been perfected. For salvation everyone strives in his spiritual life, and for salvation also the ministry of evangelizing, pastorship, and preaching is being carried out. A great theological dispute rose in the 60s regarding the subject of salvation, which gave rise also to various questions. Thereupon, two conferences were held for the Sunday schools of Lower Egypt in Benha in March and April 1966. A great number of ministers attended, and two lectures were delivered on salvation, besides the answers given to the questions raised by ministers. This book is the fruit of these two lectures and the answers of the said questions. It was published in 1967 and entitled, Salvation in the Orthodox Concept. The first edition was followed by many others. This book was translated into English by the translator Miss Widad Abbas and printed in Los Angeles in 1986. The same translation revised the translation and a second edition was published. The subject of salvation is a great one that could not be included in just one book. Therefore, a second book entitled, The Heresy of Salvation in a Moment, was issued and is currently being translated. I hope its translation would be published soon, God willing. Both books are among the subjects taught to the seminarians in St. Mark Seminary in Cairo and its branches under comparative theology. Pope Shenouda III Preface to the first edition of 1967. This research, written by His Grace Amba Shenouda, Bishop of the Institutes of Religion and Church Education, is distinguished for its clarity, preciseness, and generality. It deals with one of the most important subjects that occupy the minds of the believers in all ages, for it relates to the issue of salvation. This issue is the objective of faith and the crown of Christian hope. In this research you will find the upright orthodox education supported by the proper reasoning and correct use of the holy texts, thus revealing any equivocations. I affirm that this valuable book did treat the subject of salvation for the first time in a perfect way that is capable of giving a true picture of our orthodox teaching regarding the issue of salvation. Gregorius General Bishop of High Education, Coptic Culture and Scientific Research Introduction The Danger of Using One Single Verse When treating the subject of salvation, as it is the case with any other subject, you should be fully aware, brethren, of the danger of using one single verse separate from the other verses of the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible is not mere verses, but a certain spirit involves all its parts. A foolish person puts before him one verse or part of a verse only, separating it from the circumstances and the occasion on which it was said, and even from the general context. But a wise researcher who seeks truth brings together all the texts relating to the topic of his research to see what they signify. With respect to the subject of salvation, let us take some examples which show the danger of using one verse alone. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Acts 16.31 Some people take this verse as a proof that salvation can be attained through faith alone. That is because St. Paul the Apostle says in this verse to the Philippian jailer, Believe and you will be saved. Acts 16.31 Those who depend on this verse forget various things. To whom it was said, What is the rest of the verse? What happened afterwards? 
what about the other verses that relate to the same subject? First, this verse was said to one of the Gentiles, an unbeliever. Whatever good deeds that person might do would not benefit him unless he believed on Christ. Thus, it was necessary to guide him to the first step without which he could attain no salvation. If he took that step, he would be guided to the other following steps. It was not fit that the two apostles speak to that jailer about the importance of good works because this was of no use to him being an unbeliever. The proper thing was to proceed with him step by step towards the goal. Second, sometimes the first step is used in the Holy Bible to signify the whole matter which begins with this step. Take for example the words of Simeon the Elder when he took the child Jesus up in his arms. He said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Luke 2, 28-31 In fact, Simeon did not see the Lord's salvation, which was only fulfilled through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, shed on the cross when he paid for our sin by his death on our behalf. Simeon saw only the incarnation and birth of the Lord, but the incarnation of the Lord was the first executive step leading to salvation. So Simeon the elder said in confidence, For my eyes have seen your salvation. Almost the same was intended by Paul and Silas when they talked to the Philippian jailer. They did not mean that his own and his household salvation would be attained by his faith alone, but that his faith was the first step towards that goal. Perhaps the words of the Lord to Zacchaeus meant the same likewise, for when Zacchaeus promised to pay back four times what he had taken from others, the Lord said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, Luke 19.9. This means that the repentance of Zacchaeus was the first step towards the salvation of that house. Number 3. The most sure evidence that proves that by salvation here is meant the first step leading to it is the speech of the apostle to the jailer. You will be saved, you and your household. How could his family be saved merely by his faith? Does the faith of someone save another one? The proper thing is that the faith of someone serves just as a first step towards the salvation of the person himself when he is baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then this first step may convince his family to enter into faith and be a good beginning which may lead him and his house as well to salvation. Number 4. The same is evident in the following verses. For the Holy Bible says that Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Acts 16, 32-33. So when we study the verse, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household, Acts 16, 13. We have to put beside it other verses to understand the subject in full. And here is a simple example which has great significance. Once a young man came to the Lord Jesus Christ and asked him, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Matthew 19, 16. The Lord did not say to him, Believe and you will be saved. But he said, If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19.17 Would we dare say then that keeping the commandments alone is sufficient to give salvation? Without faith, without baptism, and without sacraments? Nay, we cannot do wrong against ourselves, against others, or against faith itself by using a single verse alone. In the same example, we notice that the young man replied, All these things, commandments, I have kept from my youth. What do I still back? Thereupon our Lord Jesus Christ said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Matthew 19, 21 Here also the Lord Christ did not speak to him about faith or grace. Would we, therefore, use this example to belittle the value of faith just because the Lord mentioned nothing about it in his talk concerning eternal life? No, God forbid. We cannot do such a mistake by using one single verse. 
for every situation requires a suitable speech. In this example, the Lord used the words that suited the case of that rich youth and that touched his inherent weakness. Another verse used by the Protestants and their followers is, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You may be faced with some person who concentrates on one verse only saying to you, See, there is an explicit verse about justification by faith. You need not argue or say a word. Would you deny the verse or object to God's words? Say to him, No, brother, we neither deny the verse nor object to God's words, but we put beside this verse another one from the same epistle of St. Paul, the apostle to the Romans, to see what we can understand. The apostle says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Romans 2.13 here, the Apostle talks about the justification of the doers of the law. Would we then make such a mistake as to depend on this verse alone to say that works alone may save a person? Nay, but we put together the two verses, Romans 2.13 and Romans 5.1, and this will provide us with the right teaching which conforms with God's words. In other words, the role of faith in justification does not ignore the importance of works, and likewise, the necessity of works for justification does not deny the value of faith. Beside the verse, having been justified by faith, we can put another verse also. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? James 2:24 through 25. Let us take another verse. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Romans 2:5. Does this verse mean that God justifies the ungodly though he continues in his ungodliness without repenting? God forbid. In order to understand this verse, we should put beside it other verses that might make it clear. Let us begin with a verse from the same epistle to the Romans, which says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Romans 1.18 Then add it to another verse from the second epistle of St. Peter the Apostle, which says, Condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. 2 Peter 2.6 by this the Apostle reveals to us that the ungodly will have the same end of Sodom and Gomorrah. St. Jude also explains the same, saying, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way. Jude 14.15 Therefore, we must not understand the verse said by St. Paul the Apostle as to mean that the ungodly needs only to believe in order to be saved, though he continues in his ungodliness. For St. Paul himself warns us expressly, saying, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6 9 through 10. As for the words, who does not work, they perhaps mean the ritual works of the law, such as circumcision in particular, as we can conclude from the verses Romans 5, 6 through 12. My beloved, it is not proper at all to follow this manner of using one single verse only. It is wrong and dangerous besides being unorthodox. Whenever anyone presents you a certain verse, however explicit and plain it may be, say to him, One verse is of no use to me. Let us bring together all the texts relating to the subject. Then we can argue. Beware being deceived by a single verse, for it might have been said on a certain occasion or might have had another part which completes it and clarifies its meaning. This will be evident from the following examples. Verses made clear by other verses following them. The Apostle Paul says in his epistle to the Ephesians, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, 
and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. And this verse might seem quite plain, but wait a little and read the verse that follows it directly. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 then it is not meet to pick up one verse rashly and unwisely say that the matter is over. Another example, St. Paul the Apostle says, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Romans 11.6 It is preferable to meditate a little and follow up what the Apostle proceeds to say in the same chapter. For he says, You stand by faith, do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God, on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Romans 11, 20-22 What does this mean? It means that you have attained salvation through the blood of the Lord Christ, but you have to hold fast to it. Otherwise, you will lose it if you do not do works meet of repentance. A branch cut off from a tree withers and dies. A third example. St. Paul the Apostle says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Romans 3, 27-28 When we read such a verse, we should not judge in haste, but we ought to read what follows. The Apostle proceeds to say, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Romans 3, 31 A fourth example. St. Paul the Apostle says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 4 through 6. Notice that this verse in particular asks about salvation through baptism and the act of the Holy Spirit. As for works, the apostle proceeds to say directly, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Titus 3, 8 Beloved brethren, I am not discussing the subject of faith and works in this introduction, for it is not time for this yet. But I want only to draw your attention to a main rule, which is the danger of using one single verse. We cannot allow ourselves to follow this harmful, dangerous method. We do not use one verse only, though it be for our benefit. For example, when we read the words of St. John the Apostle, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. We should not say that regeneration depends on works alone. We have to remember faith, baptism, and church sacraments, which things are not mentioned in the verse. Another verse also said by St. John the Apostle is, we know that we have passed from death to life, because we love the brethren. 1 John 3.14 Here we cannot say that this verse proves that love alone can save a person and convert him from death to life. The same applies to the verse. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. 1 John 4.16 we cannot also benefit from any verse that speaks about works and their importance, such as the words of the Lord Christ to the rich youth. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19.17 Is it possible that merely keeping the commandments would be sufficient without faith or baptism? Certainly not. We have to consider the circumstances involving the verse to be able to understand the real meaning. Thus, my beloved, to be acquainted with the right faith, we have to remember always the beautiful verse, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 
2 Corinthians 3.6 Let us search then into the concept of salvation guided by the spirit of the Holy Bible, not by the letter, and try to bring together the various texts relating to the subject. Let us approach the subject from all sides, not from one side only, nor regarding certain circumstances alone. I advise you to avoid reading foreign books that may lead you astray from the right faith. I advise you also to be humble when searching such matters because self-conceit regarding theological matters has led many to fallen heresies. After this short introduction, we shall speak about salvation in the orthodox concept and its media.